In recent decades, leftist activists have popularized the claim that one in five women will be raped during their undergraduate years. Some radicals have inflated that statistic to one in four. Now, if those numbers would true, were true, it would mean that women on the picturesque green of Harvard Yard are in greater danger of violent sexual attack than they would be in the back alleys of Botswana. No reasonable person believes that. Least of all, the purported victims, many of whom, according to the source of that statistic, quote, had not realized they had been raped until left-wing activists informed them of their victimhood. <laughs> many people have heard the one in five statistic. Very few people know where it comes from. It comes from a 13-question survey designed by the social scientist Mary Koss for Kent State University students back in 1976. The first 12 questions addressed various sexual acts with different degrees of ambiguity. The 13th question asked bluntly, have you ever been raped? And according to Mary Koss, many respondents got the question wrong. Seems a little strange, doesn't it? Seems like the sort of question that a respondent would not be able to get wrong. But Koss did not like how few women reported having been raped. So she rewrote and readministered the survey to 6,000 university students across 32 campuses throughout the country. She determined that 27% of respondents, that's more than one in four, I'm no mathematician, but I'm pretty sure that's one, more than one in four, had suffered rape since the age of 14. But only 55% of those clinically classified victims agreed with Koss's assessment. Now, even the real number that Koss found would be troubling, very troubling, if true. And we'll get to that in one second. But Koss, like all the other liberal hoaxers, could not help but embellish and lie to further her political agenda. A more recent survey by the Association of American Universities arrived at the one in four statistic in an even cruder way. The social scientists administering the survey simply redefined rape. The surveyors found that 11% of female undergraduate respondents suffered rape according to the legal definition of those terms, rape or sodomy. But that number soared to 23% when measured by the vaguer category of sexual assault, which might include any unwanted, quote, grabbing, groping, or rubbing against the other in a sexual way, even if the touching is over the other's clothes. But the broad definition robs the statistic of all of its meaning. One cannot compare an unwanted pinch, however unpleasant, however immoral, however illegal, to rape. Still, even discarding the preposterous one in four number, the survey's findings that 11%, 11% of female undergraduates had suffered rape or sodomy, that still sounds implausibly high. And a closer look at the data reveals that it is, because just half of those 11% of respondents reported any force involved in their encounter. The other half reported being too drunk to give consent according to the law, which raises a problem for the statisticians. Sexual encounters and drinking go hand in hand on college campuses. I do not need to inform a, an audience of college students of that fact. Depending on the circumstances, the law or a social scientist with an agenda might classify an ostensibly consensual sexual encounter as rape, even if neither party involved agreed with that assessment. A crime might well have taken place. One party or even both parties might have considered the encounter coercive, even absent physical force. The structure of the survey means we simply cannot know. But even counting, none of the drunken encounters is rape, five and a half percent, that is a staggering number. Are one out of every 18 girls on college campuses really raped during their education? That statistic would be horrifying if it were true. It almost certainly is not true, not even close to true, as even the researchers had to admit. The reason is that fewer than one in five students who were asked to take the survey agreed to do so. Hundreds of thousands of students chose not to participate. This likely accounts for a non-response bias. Non-response bias, according to the researchers, is when students who are, have been assaulted are more likely to take the survey in the first place. These methodological issues and others explain the discrepancy between one in four and one in five and the data that the Department of Justice has, have gathered over the past several decades, which show that female college students are significantly less likely to be raped or sexually assaulted than non-student women of the same age. The DOJ found a victimization rate of 7.6 among 1,000 non-students and 6.1 among 1,000 students. In both cases, the DOJ data show victimization rates more than an order of magnitude lower 
than the liberal ideological surveys suggest. Not only is Harvard not more dangerous for women than Botswana, it isn't even more dangerous than the surrounding neighborhoods of Boston, which we all know. Everybody knows that intuitively. And yet the popular fantasy of campus rape as an, rape as an epidemic persists, encouraged by regular high-profile hoaxes. In 2016, a female student from this very state at Austin P. State University reported a sexual assault. She refused to provide a description of the suspect. She changed her story. She later admitted that she made the whole thing up. That same year, an undergraduate woman at Clemson falsely claimed to have been abducted and sexually assaulted. The following year, a female undergraduate at the College of Charleston accused her classmate of sexual assault after a night of drinking. A jury took just 28 minutes to acquit the falsely accused man. The evidence was so overwhelming that the woman had lied. But by that point, the college had already labeled the man a rapist and thrown him out of school. These hoaxes are not without consequences. That's why it's so important to get to the truth of these matters, the truth that the liberals want to cover up. That same year, a 21-year-old Michigan student claimed to have been raped by a stranger while walking back to her car. When police investigated, she refused a physical examination. She changed virtually every detail of her account. The story unraveled. When she finally named a suspect, that suspect presented investigators with text messages from the accuser in which the accuser had accused another man at a different location of committing the same rape. Police later charged her with filing a false report. And then there was Rolling Stone. Do you remember the Rolling Stone story? I, I have been paying a lot of attention to Rolling Stone running false stories because they happened to do one against me recently. And so I, I was already skeptical of their journalism, but they really blew it back in 2014. Rolling Stone alleged in a lengthy article that members of the Phi Kappa Psi fraternity had gang raped an undergraduate identified only as Jackie as part of an initiation ritual. The thinly sourced story offered no evidence for its shocking claims. The accuser's story, as you may recall, fell apart and Rolling Stone retracted the story in its entirety the following year, par for the course for Rolling Stone and the liberal media and the whole liberal establishment. When it comes to sexual hoaxes, this is not a new phenomenon either. This is a time-tested strategy that has served the liberal agenda well for decades. Do you remember the Duke Lacrosse scandal? 2006, a stripper named Crystal Gale Mangum alleged that members of the Duke Lacrosse team had raped her. The prosecutor, Mike Nifong, suppressed evidence as the case fell apart, and all charges were dropped the following year. Now, Nifong was later disbarred. Mangum ended up in prison for murdering her boyfriend, but justice came too late for the members of the Duke lacrosse team, whose education and reputations were destroyed, destroyed for a lie, specifically a lie designed to advance a liberal political agenda.